that motion was only on the right side of the seat. These are the areas of melting right here. And they go in the angle that Dr. Sicking's reconstruction tell us. This was at about a 22 degree angle. When I put a light on those, you can see that there's just a, a scuff with melting of portions of that fabric coming this way. There's a support structure that comes across here, so it forms a little ridge, and it was contact here, and then right over the ridge where we see those abrasions. That says the occupant moved forward and moved forward considerably under force during the event. There's also findings on other portions of the seat. As you look down into the seat cushion, there is a support wing that would normally be to the right of the torso. Your arm would typically go over that. This is a support structure. And it's not, it's just kind of a positioning rest. It's not a, something that's uh, designed to force you into that position. The underlying metal of that support structure is bent to the right. And when you look right at the top of that support structure where the velour transitions to a, what looks like a vinyl, there is a scuff with some fabric that is bunched over to the right side, and there's a scuff that goes to the right, and then a subsequent scuff, a higher speed scuff going forward. When you look at that up close, you can see bunched material over to the right, and there's evidence that the occupant went to the right as well as going forward we have a more complex crash here. As you look at the toe pan, this is the pedals. Here is the steering column penetrating through the toe pan. That's the floorboard area in the front. There is a scuff just to the left. And as you recall, there was a fracture dislocation of the left ankle, indicating further forward motion of the left side in towards the floor. Those marks help us understand the occupant kinematics and they are consistent with what we see in the vehicle dynamics. We know that occupant kinematics follow from Newton's first law because Newton's first law says an object in motion remains in motion until acted upon by some force. The force typically begins by being applied to the car. The car gets changed and the occupant in motion is the occupant inside and continues parallel and opposite to the principal direction of force. And when that happens, we know how that looks. This happens to be a picture of me in one of my crash tests back in the Air Force, and it's a lateral hit. It's in a, it's in a direction within eight degrees of the lateral motion of that other hit that we talked about from the 36 car. It's in the opposite direction. Here I'm moving from a hit that was on this side and I'm moving to my left. As you recall, the 36 car impact was on the right side. That occupant would move to the right. I'm in this harness wearing a harness that is both stiffer and offers greater lateral support because of the way the harness is implemented with some double straps up here. But it is a five-point harness with a central buckle, a crotch strap, two lap belts, and I'm wearing a helmet. The velocity change is probably a little, it is a little higher than what was experienced in the 36 car, but the acceleration level is pretty similar. And the motion you would expect for the occupant of the 36 car would in fact be greater than what you see here because of the differences in the restraint system. The other thing that you can see as you look at this is that you can also understand that helmets obey Newton's first law just like people do. And as the occupant tends to go this way, the helmet starts rotating over my head. It does so less in this particular case because I've got a nape strap that comes across under the, kind of on the back of my neck that helps retain that helmet. But it still opens up the area in the occipital region, even with that helmet. You would expect greater rotation in Dale Earnhardt's helmet. So helmets obey the same principles, and I've looked at that helmet, and it does show evidence of having moved with respect to the head. The microphone attachment, for example, has been pushed up and imprinted into the edge of the helmet on the left side. So the conclusion is that not only did the occupant move to the right, but the helmet tried to continue going further and rotated on the head. 
I would like to show you an example of the type of motion that I'm talking about. This is not a great quality video, but I'm going to show it to you anyway. It's the best copy we have. It's a copy of a video that was made in which Johnny Benson is driving a car. Uh, we thank him for providing this. It makes an impact to the wall, not a big impact to the wall. He ended up driving the car away. It does not have the kind of damage. But here he is. Here's his helmet. Here's a side support here. Hands on the wheel. Here comes the hit. That's not a big hit, but did you see that he moved in response to that motion or in response to that, those forces on the car? This is kind of a, a, a still frame from the video, but you can kind of get a sense of the helmet. And if you can see, he's kind of doing what I did in that crash test. Your head doesn't just rotate this way. It rotates this way and roll, but it also yaws, and you end up looking towards the floor, and the helmet is moving further than he is. His hand is off the steering wheel. And as he comes back, the helmet, even in a full-face helmet here, is displaced even still as he comes back at a point that is still displaced with respect to his head and not lined up with it. What we understand from this impact analysis and from looking at the evidence in the vehicle is that a complex set of kinematics occurred because in these kinematics, the occupant started from generally in this position. This would be basically a normal driving position for Dale Earnhardt. He tended to drive with his head to the left, more over towards the window. I don't know exactly where his head was at the time this crash took place because as he's starting to steer, he may have looked to the right, he may have moved his head off the headrest. I don't know those things, but I'm going to give you just a representative scenario and drawings that are not intended to depict precise motions. You know, I can't tell you that his fingers were just this way or his arms were just this way, but we're talking about a set of complex kinematics which I'm going to try to represent with these drawings. During the impact with the 36 car, he necessarily would have responded in a way at least as much and potentially significantly more than did Johnny Benson in the video clip that you just saw or in my crash test. The helmet would rotate over and the area where we're talking about finding evidence of contusion on the head is located right here. That puts him in a position where the left side of his head is leading instead of the front portion of his head. I would expect him to be in the process of that response. He is not likely to be at the full amount of that response. He's probably coming back some from that response. But the 36 car impact occurred approximately 400 milliseconds before wall impact. That's approximately twice the duration of an eye blank that you just did. The 36 car hits, the response is here, and then as an occupant would move forward and to the right at about a 22 degree angle, the head would be trying to go to the right, but as the torso belt arrests the torso motion, the head is going to begin to swing back towards the left after having displaced forward. Now we don't know where in the process the seat belt separated. If we knew exactly when that was, we could be much more specific about some of these things. But we do know that the seat belt separated under load at a time that allowed further excursion forward. And we know that when the belt separates, the buckle moves further forward. And that's where the torso straps are attached. So the torso can move further forward. And that means the head can move further forward. And that occurs with the left side of the head leading. And as it swings back around, a greater displacement occurs. And there are two opportunities for head contact to produce blunt force injuries of the head. One is in conjunction with contact with the steering wheel rim with the helmet displaced. And the other one would be on rebound. Let's look at the steering wheel rim potential first. With the helmet displaced, contact could occur directly to that portion of the head. 
it could occur and would be expected to occur in a fashion not with the head pushing forward on the steering wheel. These steering wheels are designed to be hit and pushed forward under impact, and they move forward with a velocity with a force applied somewhere in the neighborhood of two to 300 pounds in that neighborhood as you push forward. That provides some ride down of the head against it. But if you hit a ring structure more radially, it's stiffer. And when you measure it, it's about 1,300 pounds. That provides a significant opportunity, and when you go through the kinematic analysis, you find that the velocity between the head and the steering wheel that could develop in the distance it would take to get there would put this well above 30 miles an hour and sufficiently uh, powerful an impact to produce a basal or skull fracture in conjunction with the head tension that would also, or neck tension that would also be present. Rebound provides another opportunity because as you rebound, the head, the head is pulled back by the torso. The helmet wants to continue to stay forward. And so there's an even greater displacing characteristic of the helmet as it comes back. So we see two specific opportunities, and I can't tell you which one of those occurred. But the kinematics are consistent with that kind of motion. And then as the person makes a secondary rebound, additional modest contacts would take place that would not expect to be, you'd not expect them to be injurious, but could certainly move the helmet back into a more normal position. Well, we need to talk a little bit about biomechanics and we're done. We need to know a little bit about ring fractures. I won't try to educate you entirely about that, but I'll make some comments about it. These are part of the evidence for what we conclude as being a blunt force impact to the head, as the pathologist stated was the cause of death, in conjunction with some neck tension. We'll talk about our basis for that. We'll look at some alternate theories that have been talked about around the country. And we'll look, I'll at least mention to you that I went on and did sled testing in this case, and I put a uh, a hybrid three uh, anthropomorphic test dummy, ballasted up and sized up to be the size of Dale Earnhardt, put it in a position deviated to the right, and got motion forward and into the steering wheel, and then contact on rebound. The rebound contact is a little different in the sled test, but taking into account the fact that the rebound should cur more to the left, it certainly provides a basis for significant contacts in either of those two positions. Let's talk a little bit about ring fractures. First of all, they're a relatively common fatal injury in car crashes. We see them frequently. We tend to see them as a result of impact to the head. You don't have to impact the floor of the skull. You typically can't access that because the neck is attached. But you can impact the head in a number of different locations and produce ring fractures to the base of the skull as a result of either tension, compression, or torsion, that's twist, on the skull base. The same kind of fracture can be produced from a number of different kinds of impact. You can get the same kind of fracture from a head impact that you get from straight torsion or from a hyperextension type of impact. Jim Benedict and I have concluded that a head impact with neck tension likely was the cause of the ring fracture of the skull for Dale Earnhardt. We base that on the autopsy findings, which says there was a contusion and says that the cause of death was blunt force impact of the head. We base it on the vehicle dynamics analysis. And you'll see that much of these bases are portions that were developed during this investigation. They were not present and not available to everybody to start out with. We looked at an occupant kinematic analysis of a multi-collision sequence, both the 36 car and the ball. Helmet kinematic analysis, physical findings in the vehicle and on the restraint. We looked not just at the helmet kinematic analysis, we looked at the helmet, did a CT scan on it to see if it had been impacted higher up, it was not. We've analyzed the belt separation kinematics and how that allows a greater displacement. 
We've looked at the occupant injury patterns. I've shown you some of that, physical findings on the helmet, both from the CT scans and looking at it. The data in the scientific literature is consistent with impact causation to, uh, to produce the ring fracture and a biomechanical and kinematic analysis of the impact opportunities. There have been other theories discussed. A number of, of people have talked about simple head whip. People have talked about mandibular fracture. The previous analysis by Dr. Myers was one which basically talked about a combination of the two, didn't talk specifically about head whip alone, said that that could do that, but indicated neck tension in conjunction with a head impact. And based upon his data, he looked at that head impact as, if, as occurring uh, to the mandible. And so he saw that as a combination of the two. It's been reported in various ways around the country. With neck tension alone, I looked to see if there was something that would tend to give us conclusions with neck tension alone. I looked for the kind of torso contact that would produce the violent head whip that could produce that. I did not see dramatic injuries to the torso. We saw the rib fractures, which we discussed, but not internal injuries to the torso. I looked to see if there was evidence of stretching in the back of the neck from a head whip. That was looked at in the pathology findings, and that was not found. The back of the neck did not show damage to the ligaments or to the bones. And simple head whip does not explain a death caused by blunt force impacts to the head. So I don't think we're looking at something. I think it's possible that you can get, and you can certainly get, basilar skull fractures that way. I think it's relatively unlikely that that is the explanation in this case you would not expect to see evidence of head contact. If you were looking at mandibular impact or man impact to the chin, you would look for some findings on the chin. The findings that we see on the abrasion that's described to the right side of the chin from the data I have would appear more consistent with the chin strap of the helmet as the helmet is attempting to rotate off the head, particularly with contact to the head. You can certainly get a basilar skull fracture with mandibular contact, certainly in the presence of neck tension. But I would expect a kinematic trajectory consistent with that. And if I am moving forward with the left side of my head leading, I would not expect to hit the right side of my mandible. And particularly if the left side of my head is leading and I'm to the, already to the right of the steering wheel and moving to the right, I would not expect to hit the right side of my mandible nor would I expect to see evidence of contusion to another part of the head. So those two, that because of the findings that we have developed in the analysis of the kinematics, the earlier finding basically said neck tension with some head impact, which in, based upon that data was from the mandible. I'm saying there's some neck tension involved, but the head impact is more likely to be here, and it's in neither case likely to be pure head whip or pure head stre neck stretch. Our conclusions are these. And it's consistent with the analysis of things that where problems develop in something that normally works pretty well. There's a tendency to want to have a single finding that you can say, ah, that did it and that's what it is, and, and that's what's at fault, and that makes it a lot easier to report, I suppose. But typically, when something that normally works pretty well, if just one thing goes wrong, it tends to still work pretty well. When multiple things come together and go wrong together, that's when you have problems, and that's what has happened here. There were multiple events, each of which provided factors which contributed or potentially contributed to the injury. And what we see is one of the factors was a very severe collision at a critical angle to the wall. We see a significant car-to-car -car collision that occurred very shortly, twice the duration of an eye blink before that occurred. 
that prepositioned the occupant, and in that prepositioning impact, and in the wall impact, and in the rebound, all of those provide a basis for further displacement of the helmet with respect to the head. The seat belt separated. It separated under load, and it allowed additional forward motion. On the basis of our analysis, I cannot give you a relative contribution that it was 30% this and 40% that. But what I cannot say is that there was no potential contribution when you have a head impact in a setting in which a belt separates and allows greater displacement. Finally, we believe that as a result of those combination of factors that we've listed, that he sustained a fatal ring fracture to the base of his skull as a result of occipital contact, likely in the presence of some neck tension, either as he responds to the wall impact after having been prepositioned to the right, or on rebound. Now that leaves us with multiple factors to look at. And that's the kind of thing that I think Mike has, Helton has defined for you as far as where we go going forward. That there are things that we can do that would be worth doing to be helpful in that regard. For one thing, it would be nice not to see seat belts separate. And he's talked about a study that is uh, going to take place that I will have some participation in. We also would like to see better control of occupant displacement. And NASCAR's recommendations already respond to that in the case of recommending of head and neck restraints, but also in the case of recommending the attachment of shoulder harnesses in a fashion that allows more predictable motion of the occupant. There's already developments in nets to the right side that would limit some of that displacement that we talked about. So those things are being addressed, but we need to be able to be cautious in the way we approach that. As Mike said at the outset, history is replete with attempts to radically alter and immediately alter complex systems that work well by making a big change to redesign it on the basis of the last problem. We need to make sure that we do not allow radical changes to be taken without considering the unintended consequences that can occur. And that's basically where this thing points us to, is some improvements that can take account of the kinds of unusual and unfortunate combinations of circumstances that we see bringing about the death of Dale Earnhardt. Thanks very much. Jim, I guess it's for you. And you've been watching live coverage of NASCAR's uh, more than uh, four or five month investigation, multi-million dollar investigation into the death of Dale Earnhardt, the last speaker, James Radden, the biodynamic research uh, developer, and uh, clearly stating that it was no one factor that killed Dale Earnhardt at the Daytona 500, but a number of factors. Earlier, NASCAR President Mike Helton spoke about changes. Among these, it's not mandatory for the head and neck restraint, which will certainly come under fire and something we will discuss in a moment with uh, our uh, NASCAR analyst, Daryl Waltrip, and three-time Winston Cup champion. But the installation of the black box, similar to what they have on airplanes, they use that uh, currently in CART and IRL, a recording device to understand what goes on in accidents like these in the car. Uh, certainly further study on restraint systems, 41 of the uh, 43 drivers in last Sunday's NASCAR race were wearing uh, some type of safety device, but again, not making that mandatory, according to Mike Helton, and a full-time uh, NASCAR doctor who will work with track doctors, but not what drivers had wanted, which was a full-time medical staff, uh, but at least a step certainly in that direction. Uh, but among the major revelations here is that uh, Dr. Uh, James Radden saying there was no cut belt, certainly a belt separated by force and weight, because it had been reconfigured or altered in its installation, indicating that uh, Dale Earnhardt's uh, seatbelt arrangement, again, whether this was the cause or not, it certainly was one of the contributing factors. And uh, if that seatbelt was installed properly or unaltered, uh, we certainly don't know uh, what effect uh, that may have had, but it certainly could have been better news for Dale Earnhardt. James Radden, one of the expert researchers describing Earnhardt's seatbelt, a factor in the crash to those fatal injuries. Those marks tell us that Dale Earnhardt moved forward into a separated belt, which could not have occurred unless the belt separated under load. 
so the physical evidence is clear both on the belt and in the injuries that the belt separated under load. We've addressed these two. Other parts of the report which you will receive, we'll talk about fiber analysis showing that these were torn fibers, not fibers cut with an instrument. DNA analysis that says that the blood on the belt is the same as the blood in the car. And there was a difference in the way it was deposited. If the blood was deposited first and you cut across it, you would expect to see similar blood deposition on both sides of the cut. What we see is different kinds of blood de deposition on one side than you see on the other side, different amounts and ways in which that blood is deposited. You've seen the medical examiner photographs, and there were extensive interviews of those who had access to the belt. The conclusion is clear. There was no cutting of the belt afterwards. It's a belt that's separated under load. Earlier statements, part of the hour and 15 presentation uh, in Atlanta with NASCAR and its uh, experts, a very detailed uh, graphic and specific explanation of what happened, although many details and implications still to sift through in this report. And to help us uh, do that, uh, we join our NASCAR racing analyst and uh, three-time Winston Cup champion, uh, Darrell Waltrip, who is with us live from Franklin, Tennessee. Darrell, uh, thanks for taking a moment. How are you? Hey, Chris. I'm doing fine. Good to see you or hear you or hey, whatever. Or, or coordinate with you. <laughs> but now you were observing this as we were, Daryl. And let me first ask you uh, your reaction. Uh, many people thought that NASCAR, maybe that there was a cover-up or whatever. Were they as forthcoming with the information as you hoped they would be? Well, first of all, I'm very satisfied uh, with the explanation, the graphic about the separated seatbelt. I've had this confusion in my mind about why the seat belt had to be separated. Now I understand to see how it slid through the uh, adjuster and how it ratcheted and tore itself apart. I now understand that and, and I, I'm, I, can, I can live with that explanation and I understand it now better than I had before with the graphics. I'm, I'm like a lot of other folks, a, a picture is worth a thousand words and once I saw how the belt was mounted and I think that's a key yeah. issue here Chris, uh, the belts were mounted in the car, maybe not according to recommendation. And uh, they touched on that lightly, talking about how the belts were mounted lower and how that gave them a little more give and so on and so forth. Uh, that's, that's a concern. One of the big concerns to me is, is uh, I heard Mike say, Mike Helton say, that they were going to work with each driver individually to help them find a head and, and, and neck restraint that they would be comfortable with. I take that to mean that they're going to take each driver individually, those particularly that are not in favor of using it right now, and work with them to find either a Hans or a Hutchins or whatever so that every driver will have uh, a head and neck restraint system uh, that they can use and, and feel comfortable with. I hope that's what he was saying and I believe it was. The other thing that I was a little bit, uh, I, would, I would like to have seen them be a little more aggressive on and I can't think of any reason why they couldn't have been, is the black box. Uh, I think they could be put in the car right away. I don't know uh, of, of any problem or any time that it would take to mount that box or to get that, that uh, information available. Uh, so I, I, I was really disappointed when he said that was going to be instituted in, in 2002. like to see that done right away. Yeah, in fact, the, the four points, the changes that Mike Helton, uh, NASCAR president, alluded to are for next year. But uh, let's go back to the, to the seat belt, uh, Darrell. And, and now, is that something that should have been caught in, in inspection uh, if a driver alters or reconfigures his seatbelt before he, he goes out into a race? Well, I, Chris, this is where I believe uh, that you have to draw a line. Uh, in no way do you want to, uh, am I trying to offend drivers, in no way am I trying to, uh, to, to put NASCAR on the spot, but there is a recommended way. It comes in the package with the seatbelts a recommended way to mount the seat belts, the angles at which they should be mounted so that the weight, the load that is being put on the belt, uh, that that will maximize that load if they're mounted correctly. I'm sure that, you know, there's a tolerance for all of those things, but uh, once they get so far out of tolerance, and I believe someone, uh, you know, should say, hey, that you can't mount your belts that way, they need to be remounted or, or changed. And so, yeah, uh, and I think that may be one of those things that all of a sudden, uh, you know, we look at, it's, it's the blind obvious. You look at a car, you look at a car, you see the seat belts mounted, yeah, they're in there, they got the right mounting brackets and so on and so forth, but they need to be mounted exactly like the mounting instructions say, and it could have been overlooked.
And, and that's something obviously NASCAR will have to crack down on. Uh, the, you have been in favor of making some type of head and neck safety device mandatory. Uh, are you satisfied enough you touched on it, but it seems like why not? I know there's the liability factor, but why wouldn't NASCAR say, given the presentation we just saw, there's evidence that you have a better chance in these accidents with some type of device and they are made now, Daryl, you know, that, that you can make them a little more custom oriented so the drivers are safe in that cockpit area. Well, I, I believe, you know, I, I keep hearing one size doesn't fit all. Hey, we'll get different sizes. I don't have a problem with that. Uh, the Hans device, there are some racetracks, Daytona and Talladega particularly, where I would strongly suggest and believe and mandate that you wear the, H the Hans device at those two racetracks. The Hutchins device, a little more, forget little more uh, freedom with that device. It hooks up, it's a harness that hooks to your helmet. And I used it. I used it at Michigan last week. And uh, it does, it's a little easier to deal with and it's not so clumsy and, and so bulky. And so use that on some of the smaller tracks where you don't go so fast but please guys everybody needs to use something and, it, and it, if you won't do it on your own then you should be made to do it all right and briefly Darrell, and i realize it's just your opinion but based on what we watched here if uh, the seatbelt was properly installed with the dale earnhardt and if he were wearing the hans device do you think he'd still be with us today well, I certainly think the Hans device would have made a difference. I, I, I believe, I believe what you're hearing is 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 kind of like what we all needed to hear. It wasn't any one thing. It wasn't that he didn't have the Hans. It wasn't he didn't have a full face helmet. It wasn't that the seat belt broke. It was all those things. It was that combination of all those things that did him in. All right, Daryl. Thanks for joining us from your home in Tennessee. We'll speak with you again later on the National on Fox Sports Net. Okay, Chris, thanks. Daryl Walsh for being with us. You've been watching Fox Sports Net's live coverage of NASCAR's report on the investigation into the Dale Earnhardt crash. Tune in tonight, 10.30 Eastern Time, 10.30 in all regions, when Daryl Waltrip will join us along with the NASCAR driver Jeff Burton for in-depth discussions on what this means to the future of the sport. I'm Chris Myers in Los Angeles. Now back to your regularly scheduled program. This has been a special report from Fox Sports Net. Talk to the crew on, if you hit the wrong one, you kill the motor. I think NASCAR needs to mandate a little light, letting you know when that thing is on or off. He accidentally hit it and ruined his night. Lynch was in second at the time of the incident. Gone is your leader. Woods in the 54, the spinner a moment ago. He's the first car a lap down, trying to get back around Brendan Gone to get Woo! back on the lead lap. Meantime, Steve Portengay and the 45 of Woodside. Borneman in the eighth car battling for second spot here. What do they say, Rubbin's racing? Well, then there you go. <laughs> that's plenty of racing, if that's what they say. <laughs> it is, that's for sure. It is exciting. And Brendan Gaughan has to feel good about this. He's looking up in the mirror, seeing these guys battle, seeing Tim Woods trying to get back around and get his lap back. This just allows Gaughan to further solidify his lead. This is incredible racing for this late in the event. These guys are on old tires, not long to go, and they're still side by side. Look at Reed trying the bottom here. Reed and Richards back there. They're fighting back around ninth and 10th spot now. So for Mark Reed, this has turned into not the kind of night he wanted to see by any means. Reed in the four car, trying to challenge. He's trying to hold on to the points lead tonight. I don't know that he's going to be able to do it. Here's the 45 of Woodside. Your pole sitter trying to hang on against Portengay. As they battle, Portengay is third now, or rather fourth. Woodside one spot ahead of him. Johnny Borneman up there in second in the eighth car. Where did Borneman come from? We saw him spin earlier, Kenny. He didn't lose any laps in that spin, but I'm amazed he's able to get up there and run this well. Rick, I'll tell you where he came from. Johnny Borneman come out of nowhere. <laughs> That's exactly where he came from. <laughs> You're right. I mean, you know, we know Johnny Borneman is a front runner, but, you know, he has done the same thing at a lot of the racetracks this year. He always comes in about halfway. I call him what, like, like old David Pearson, the slide fox. You think he's out of the race, and here he comes. So Johnny Borneman running strong. Look at the high entry. You know, they've been doing this. Troy Klein on the outside and Mike David on the inside now. That high entry, they enter very high. That's an incredible groove at this racetrack, how high they enter. Right up on the wall. The 5 and the 11 fighting for 5th. Meantime, the battle for 2nd spot. Borneman in the eight has that position right now, back to fifth now. There's David in the five, Klein in the 11. Now, the 24 of Sedgwick, he was a contender earlier. Second race in a row, he's had electrical problems. He is not on the lead lap. Yes, yeah, so we've got to give credit to Bill Sedgwick. All you Winston West race fans that are listening right now, when you see Bill Sedgwick, 
give him a pat on the back, let him know how strong he's been running all year, only to have a couple problems two weeks in a row and obviously rob him of that victory at Colorado. Sedgwick being shown 17th, he lost 10 laps behind the wall when they had that battery problem. David, meantime, in the five car, trying to work his way up. He sits fifth. Let me show you the full field with 50 laps to go tonight here at Irwindale. Klein in the 11. He'll make that sprint car move down low, Kenny, but unlike a sprint car, you can't really pull off a slide job in a stock car here at Irwindale. Yeah, the problem with these stock cars is the 11-inch tires do not take that slide job stuff. With a sprint car, you've got this tire on the right rear that is so wide, it's incredible. It can, it can take some of that heat that you put on, but these 11-inch tires, if you, if you slide them at all, they get so hot, then you have nothing. So David is fifth in the five. There's your leader in the 16. Still, Brendan gone from the outside of the front row tonight. Third leader of the evening. He has been the dominant car for much of this race. Second spot belongs to Borneman in the eighth. Had a good run. Sean Woodside and his crew. I thought they were buried back around 12th spot, but they made a great decision on pit road that got out quickly. And off that restart, they have taken over third. See, this is what I... Wow, look at the sparks coming out of Borneman. We've been seeing this all night long. Something in the way they've got these Winston West cars set up. They drag the bottoms off of it in the going of the race. And uh, sparks just a lot, whether it's the headers, whether it's the sway bar, I don't know. But it seems to be the thing tonight. Now, Tim Woods in that white and blue 54 car, he is not second. He's the first car one lap down. Your leader is Brendan Gone here at Irwindale. You know, most men get pretty shook up about losing their hair. But today, many of them are learning about Bosley Medical. They use your own living hair to fill in the thin spots. Just look at that. It really works. You can treat it like real hair because it is real hair. Your own naturally growing hair. So you don't have to worry about it. Bosley Medical is the world's most experienced hair restoration practice. For over 25 years, they have performed more than 130,000 procedures using the innovative micrografting techniques pioneered by founder Dr. L. Lee Bosley. Each surgeon at Bosley Medical is board certified and individually trained by me. So if you want to have your own naturally growing hair back, call this number for more information. We'll send you this free video and in-depth guidebook that gives you the real facts about hair restoration. There's no cost and absolutely no obligation. So do it for yourself. Call now and get the real results you've been looking for. It's your real hair. You can't do better than real. Early on, the A's hopes look bleak. But now, they've battled their way back. New players and a new attitude that put the A's in playoff position. Hang on the rest of the way. It's going to be a wild ride for the wild card. What a shot by Giambi. He's in here. Wednesday at 7 on Fox Sports Net. Back at Irwindale Speedway in Irwindale, California, the Food for Less 250, the NASCAR Winston West Series, the 11th race of a 14-race 2001 season. Great. single death or serious injury is one too many. The findings of NASCAR's six-month investigation into Dale Earnhardt's tragic death at the Daytona 500 produced a few surprises Tuesday and has refocused attention on safety of its drivers. It was a broken seatbelt that was one of several elements that came together to create a fatal situation for the sport's most popular star. Still, some questions remain. And we'll try to answer those right now on the National Sports Report. Welcome inside the Fox Network Center, and welcome to the program. Along with Kevin Frazier, I'm Chris Myers. Glad to have you for the National. On the show tonight, we will talk with Darrell Waltrip and driver Jeff Burton and get their feelings on NASCAR's investigation. Plus, Kurt Schilling goes for his major league leading 19th win. All right, but Kevin, this report, uh, six months in the making, containing 300 pages. It costs more than a million dollars. Yet in the end, it provides a more explanation than revelation. NASCAR's long-awaited investigation finding that several factors contributed to the February 18th crash 
that took Dale Earnhardt's life. It also takes a few steps to help prevent such a tragedy in the future, but stops short of mandating that drivers use the head and neck restraints. Van Earl Wright has more from Atlanta. NASCAR President Mike Helton said beginning next year, cars will be equipped with black box crash test recorders, similar to those used in airplanes. The organization will also have full-time physicians working with those doctors at each track and will conduct a new study on restraint systems to take a closer look at seatbelt strength. Finally, NASCAR will encourage but not demand that drivers use head restraint devices like the Hans device. We think there's still some things we need to understand completely. Uh, mandating them at this point is not uh, a wise thing to do based on production schedules of the parts and pieces themselves. It's not a quick fix. Uh, there, there's not a resolution tomorrow that Gary Nelson and John Darby and Wayne Alton can go forward with because we're not going to react as we have in the past. We are not going to react just for the sake of reacting. Experts who investigated the incident for NASCAR said the death of Earnhardt was a combination of his collision with Ken Schrader's number 36 car, the 23-degree angle that Earnhardt hit the wall, and a broken seatbelt. Contrary to many reports since the tragic accident that took the life of the sport's most popular star, his seatbelt was not cut, but broke on impact when his car hit the wall, and that head whip was not the cause of the skull fracture that killed him. The 36 car hits, the response is here, and then as an occupant would move forward and to the right at about a 22 degree angle, the head would be trying to go to the right, but as the torso belt arrests the torso motion, the head is going to begin to swing back towards the left after having displaced forward. But what I cannot say is that there was no potential contribution when you have a head impact in a setting in which a belt separates and allows greater displacement. However, not everyone was pleased with the findings. Seatbelt manufacturer Bill Simpson and his lawyers held a press conference immediately afterward, saying that if Earnhardt had installed the seatbelts properly, they would not have broken. The failure of the lap belt was not the result of a design or manufacturer deficiency but was a result of improper method of installation. It's important to know that Bill Simpson told him for years, Dale, that's wrong, it's not safe, don't do it. After all this, there still remains one simple question. Is there anything that could have been done to prevent the death of Dale Earnhardt? Had the belt not separated, had there been uh, better lateral support, for example, uh, you might think about a, a, a net to the right would certainly have have altered that. Uh, there's a number of things that would have potentially altered the outcome in this crash. Tuesday's press conference here in Atlanta marked the most significant day in the history of NASCAR since this very private organization called on outside experts to draw their conclusions on this tragic event. In fact, Earnhardt's widow, Teresa, released a statement of her own, thanking NASCAR for their investigation and their support of her family. In Atlanta, I'm Van Earl Wright for the National Sports Report. All right, thanks for that report. Later in the show, uh, do drivers alter equipment that sometimes creates greater danger? Jeff Burton and Daryl Waltrip will join us to discuss that and the thoughts on the report and whether this really is the dawn of a new era in NASCAR safety. I have no idea what's going on with Mike DeFelice, but it's not good. The Arizona catcher was first kicked out of and then arrested early Tuesday outside of a Pittsburgh bar after assaulting two female customers and then punching a parking lot attendant. A 28-year-old woman told police that DeFelice groped her, and when another woman intervened, the catcher burned her buttocks with a lighter. DeFelice was released after posting a $6,000 bond, but it gets better. DeFelice learned later Tuesday afternoon that he will be suspended for two games for his part in a bench-clearing altercation with Pittsburgh's Kevin Young last week. Both players are trying to appeal the suspension. But DeFelice sitting as the Diamondbacks took on the Pirates. Craig Council living deliciously. Great stop. They turned two, but someone scored on that one. Game tied at a deuce. Bottom of the eighth. Game still tied at two in Kurt Schilling's quest for his 19th win. Not going well. Tagged for nine hits, 
He gave up four runs in 72 thirds innings of work. Diamondbacks nine game win streak over 4-2 the final score. Giants and Expos, could they make up some ground? Barry with his daughter. She is beautiful. She obviously every takes day. after her mommy. Barry 0 for 2 with three walks on the night. Richard Aurelia though pulling the slack or picking up the slack. Top of the third, 8-0 Giants. Aurelia's 26 home run makes it 9-0. Bottom of the seventh, Russell Ortiz with a no-hitter. Orlando Cabrera hits it. Aurelia's throw pulls JT Snow off the bag. No double play. So it's a fielder's choice. No, no, still intact, but the next hitter, you hate when that happens. Mark Smith breaks up the no-no. Giants, a game and a half back. Ortiz in disbelief, but they still win 10-2. Over to the American League. Indians and A's, top of the eighth. Tied at one. Runners on second and third. Corey Lytle intentionally walks Roberto Alomar because he wants to get to Juan Gonzalez. So, Art Howe rolling the dice. Gonzalez with the bases loaded. Lytle's pitch just misses as Gonzalez gets the unintentional pass. You hate when that happens. It's the go-ahead run. Good night now. A's lose two to one the final score. As expected, the family of Northwestern football player Rashidi Wheeler has announced plans to file a lawsuit against the university later this week. The suit will also name trainers and staff who were on the field when the senior safety died of an asthma attack, but it will not name the head coach, Randy Walker. Meanwhile, Northwestern's president met with Reverend Jesse Jackson Tuesday morning and later that afternoon discussed his school's investigation for the first time. We are determined, however, not to discuss preliminary findings or any conclusions until the review is completed. We simply cannot prejudge the results of the review at this time. I can assure you, however, that when the review is completed, we will make the findings public. Still ahead, the Heat are saying goodbye to their old but tasty point guard. Tim Hardaway is the newest star in the Lone Star State. And in 90 seconds, Mark McGuire tries to do what he does best, while Junior looks to match him swing for swing. Stick around. One, one, one. When you call Compact Direct, you'll get a PC built exactly the way you want it. Like the Compact Presario 5000T, starting at just 839. Choose a fast Intel Pentium 3 processor hard drive, memory, monitor, options like a CDRW drive, and even your choice of color. Call 1-800-276-2360 today and get a free compact printer and $50 instant rebate. Pizza Love, and then Frank Catalanato, Rafi Palmero, his 33rd. Ruth Benziera had five hits on the day. El Duque gives up four homers, 11 hits, eight earned runs. He's 0-6. That's not good. Welcome back, no. Goodbye. Cardinals charging fast in the central, flying the Reds, where they got that new ballpark under construction, and Mark McGuire, who is destructive with most of pitches, hammers this for his 22nd home run of the year, and it's out near that construction site where the crew is working hard and going to go after a souvenir. Bottom of the sixth, the cards with an eight nothing lead. Ted Griffey Jr. gets into the act with a home run, and McGuire and Griff combined have 1,031 career homers. The cards have won 12 of 13. 
Tim Hardaway is finally a Mav. Miami and Dallas completed a trade late Tuesday that will land the point guard with the Mavs in exchange for a second round pick and a salary cap exception. In other words, Miami has cleared up a salary cap space to perhaps sign someone like Ronnie Sykley, who has spent the last two seasons chilling. Hardaway will earn $3.2 million next season in Dallas, but may sign a longer deal soon. FoxSports.com hockey insider Jim Kelly is reporting that free agent Brett Hall and the Red Wings are close to signing a two-year, $9 million deal. The parties are reportedly also negotiating a possible third year on the deal. A source close to the negotiations told FoxSports.com that the contract could be done as early as Wednesday morning. Well, good news for the Chargers. According to his agent, running back LaDainian Tomlinson has finally agreed to a deal in San Diego. The deal is said to be worth $38 million over six years. The fifth overall pick in the April draft will get a $10.5 million signing bonus and is expected to be in uh, camp by Wednesday. Meanwhile, Jimmy Smith of the Jags practicing for the first time this summer Tuesday. Jacksonville's leading receiver had three abdominal surgeries during the offseason, but if he continues to practice well, he could play in the Jags' preseason game against the Chiefs on Thursday. Also from the NFL, according to the Washington Post, the league will begin signing replacement officials on Wednesday and will lock out its regular refs next week if a new contract agreement cannot be reached. The sides remain far apart after a four-hour negotiating session on Monday. When we continue on the National, we'll find out why NASCAR's investigation into Earnhardt's crash left a few questions unanswered with our old buddy, Harold Walter. Stick around. The National Sports Report is brought to you by Kyocera. One company makes smartphones with wireless web access. Kyocera. One company provides total document solutions for business. Kyocera. One company creates digital cameras the size of a credit card. Kyocera. One company is a world leader in solar energy solutions. Kyocera. One company does all these things and more to improve our quality of life. One company. Kyocera. Look, this is a dirty fuel injector. This is a clean one. As you can see, cleaner works better. That's why I use STP fuel injector cleaner in my car. I add STP every time I change my oil. STP, it's basic car maintenance. You used all your cars having a payphone, didn't you? Next time, dial down the center. 1-800-C-A-L-L-A-T-T. -T. It's free for you and cheap for them. By the way, this one's hot. Save oh, big bucks on every call. Just dial 1-800-CALL-ATT for collect calls. FX presents New York Cops versus New York Firemen, a 911 cover man special Friday. Yes! Oh, my. oh, it's movie time. Oh, it's game time. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'll decide. AT&T Digital Cable from AT&T Broadband with hundreds of channel slots. Who can decide? Compromise? All right. How about romance? Comedy. Sci-fi. I want to see them all. Call now to choose the package of channels you want at the price you want. Have you been injured in any type of accident? Has someone close to you suffered the agony of a wrongful death? You may be entitled to a large cash settlement. I'm A. John Merlo. I'm the only attorney I know to get over $1 million for a soft tissue injury. You can't win on your own, but I can win for you. And if I don't, it will cost you nothing. Over 25 years of experience and over 1,000 cases tried, A. John Merlo gets results. Call now for a free consultation. 345-3333. Come on in to the new Chico Independent Auto Care and find out what real service is all about. Chico Independent Auto Care is a full-service repair facility specializing in Asian imports like Honda, Toyota, and Nissan. You'll see many of the familiar faces you've come to trust over the years, but you'll also find a commitment to excellence in every aspect of our work and a genuine desire to provide you with a level of service you simply won't find anywhere else. Chico Independent Auto Care, where customer service is always our first priority. He's rich, he's cute. Let's just see how smart he is. Do you have a satellite dish or AT&T digital cable? I have a dish. Uh, so you can't watch different channels on different sets at the same time without expensive equipment. I can't. And you can't get the latest technology without having to buy new equipment. I 
can't. And you can't keep wasting my time. I can't. AT&T Digital Cable. It's smarter. Um, mounted properly and yes or no. Just tell me if it was mounted properly or not. That's, a, that's an issue that I still have. Well, let me, uh, Darrell, let me ask that question to, to George because it was an inferred, or it, I seem to get the impression from James Radden, one of the specialists, uh, George, who, who spoke on behalf of NASCAR, that, that, that there was a reconfiguration or that the seatbelt was not mounted properly in Dale Earnhardt's car. Is that, is that true? Okay, number one, NASCAR was never aware of an installation problem until this particular investigation. And it's my understanding, and you need to ask Richard Childress, right. that he was never made aware of an installation problem in his in Dale Earnhardt's car number three. Let's also remember NASCAR's philosophy with the cocoon. NASCAR believes that its role in safety is to provide the best information to the drivers and take a leadership role, which we did today. Right. Okay? Now, at the end of the day, the guy that makes a decision and is the guy that drives the car. We believe in empowering him to make the final decision on the restraint system that he chooses. NASCAR's role with the drivers, teams, and manufacturers to provide the best information possible hey, for hey, those George. for those guys. All right, Daryl, go ahead. Hey, George, George, if you you are NASCAR, a NASCAR inspector saw something wrong in a race car, and he told that driver that's wrong, and you should fix that, and that driver told him that's the way I'm going to run my car, that's my department. You go mind your own business. I'll take care of this. If you're going to leave it up to the driver, no. how much of it do you leave up to the driver? Okay, NASCAR's position is to make the, you, the drivers and teams available the latest safety information, like we did in Indianapolis, where we talked about head restraints, flew an expert in from Germany, had Dr. Melvin talk about six-point harnesses, head padding, and rolled out a new seat. Now, at the end of the day, if something can conclusively be proven not to be in the best interest, then we'll address that with rules. The point here is, though, we didn't know that there was an installation problem, okay? Right. So we now know there's a problem, and we're addressing it, addressing it through a comprehensive restraint study, which was announced today. You see a point, George, where NASCAR will make some type of head and neck uh, safety device mandatory? Well, I think the drivers will have to make that determination on their own. I would say this, uh, data boxes, a medical liaison, a new uh, restraint study, the opening of a technology center, the development of a world-class computer model, and a real commitment from NASCAR to, to take a leadership position in safety. And, by the way, the most comprehensive, in-depth presentation of an, a crash investigation in U.S. motorsports history. So while we may not be perfect, we have certainly have made great strides, and I certainly think today Mike Houghton laid out a real commitment to safety. All right, well, thank you very much, Senior Vice President of NASCAR, uh, George Pine, joining us from Atlanta. Thanks, George. Thank you. Thanks, D.W. All right. Yeah, and to Daryl Waltrip from his home in Tennessee. Thanks, D.W. We'll talk to you again real soon. Okay, Chris. Thanks. Uh, 41 of the 43 drivers in last weekend's race did wear the Hans or a similar safety device, including Dale Earnhardt Jr. We'll talk with Jeff Burton about that when we come back. This Fox Stroke segment was brought to you by Acura. This coupon on cases of Mountain Dew gets you a seat for a Saturday or Sunday A's game with a special Mountain Dew zone for only two bucks. And now select fans will bring home this amazing collectible Jason Giambi bobblehead doll. Get in the zone with Mountain Dew, the A's, and Fox Sports Net. presentation at an invitation only premiere by controlling who sees your resume and who doesn't leaving just you your resume and the person who's hiring Dockers Mobile Pad. What 
is it that makes the worker bee work so hard? Introducing the new improved copper top. Duracell's best ever. Wendy's makes late nights great nights, serving up your favorite. Hello? Get a Wendy's classic half-pound double with cheese even late, because our pickup window's open late. A big Wendy's thank you goes out to the man in the red minivan. NFL Sunday Ticket. Up to 13 regular season games every Sunday, and it's not on cable. Now get our best programming package free for four months, plus free installation. Hey! Tell your own fortune. Post your resume and see what tomorrow holds. Even if you already have a job, it's free, easy, and confidential. You control who sees your resume and who doesn't. So log on and leave nothing to chance. Major League home run leader Barry Bonds and the Giants head east to take on the Red Hot Mike Piazza and the Mads. Giants, Mads, FX Baseball, Saturday at 7 Eastern, 4 Pacific. Welcome back to the show as we continue our review of NASCAR's final report on the death of Dale Earnhardt. And NASCAR's governing body concluding its investigation Tuesday after a six-month inquiry. A veteran NASCAR driver Jeff Burton, the winner of this year's Coca-Cola 600, joining us from Charlotte, North Carolina. And Jeff has been uh, very outspoken about... Uh, driver safety and improving that. Uh, Jeff, thanks for taking a moment to, to join us. Are the, the four points that uh, NASCAR uh, President Mike Helton talked about putting into effect uh, to improve safety, uh, are they, obviously it's a step in the right direction, from a driver's point of view, are they enough? The four points that Mike made, I think, are very, very valid points. And I think all of those points are in the right direction. We will never do enough. This is, it will never be enough. Safety We'll never, we'll never get to the point where it's completely safe enough, that it just can't happen. So what we've got to do is continue to work and make things better, and I think these are definite steps in the right direction. Jeff, do some drivers do little things uh, just to make themselves feel more comfortable that might cut corners on some safety issues? Well, I think certainly that drivers do things and teams do things that they feel is the right thing to do. Dale Earnhardt didn't have his seatbelt mounted in his car because he knew it was less dangerous or more dangerous. He had it mounted in there because he thought that was the best way to do it. This is where I get back into education. If NASCAR goes out and does the study that they're talking about doing on, on safety restraint systems and the proper way to, them, to install them, once they have completed that study, then yes, they can come in and say, your seat belts are wrong, you're not going to run until you fix them. Until they've completed that study, I don't think they can do it. Uh, was Dale Earnhardt able to get away with uh, more because of who he was and the success he had in the sport and the amount of times that he walked away from what looked like uh, very dangerous crashes? I don't think he got by more with NASCAR. I think that what Dale Earnhardt had done is the same thing that we all do. When you have success in, in doing something and you, you don't want to change that, Dale Earnhardt wanted the seat and the seat belts and everything in his car the way that he had it with his helmet, with his gloves, with his shoes, with everything that he had, he believed it to be the best based on his experience. And by the way, he had reason to believe that. He, he, he had been through some tremendous wrecks, obviously without a fatality until this one, without major injury until this one. So he had reason to believe he was doing the right thing. He wasn't being an idiot. He wasn't being dumb. He wasn't being, he wasn't full of bravado. The, the stuff wasn't, everything didn't work right in this situation, but he did it the way he thought was best. All right, even in his loss, uh, Dale Earnhardt still helping and giving uh, to the sport and its drivers. In summation then, Jeff, you, you feel safer uh, today going into a car with these, uh, these new points in place or next year than ever before? Well, I don't feel safer today versus how I felt yesterday. I feel safer than I did 12 months ago because we started at Roush Racing a concerted effort to making our cars safer and educating and learning the right things to do. Now, I will feel safer 12 months from now than I do today because I think the things that NASCAR has stepped up and said they're going to do is going to be a major impact in a positive way. Jeff, uh, thank you very much for joining us from Charlotte, and, and good luck the, uh, the rest of the NASCAR season. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, but we come back on the National, the best plays from the day and night in our final cut. Stay with us. The National Sports Report is brought to you by Kingsford Charcoal, because taste is everything.
Does anyone here at the Beef and Bird Barbecue Cook-Off use a gas grill? Gas is a no-no, definitely a no-no. So when it comes to flavor... Proven fact that charcoal is better than gas. What kind of charcoal? Oh, Kingsford, definitely. Kingsford. Seriously? 100%. Kingsford charcoal, because taste is everything. Revenge fueled him. He's the most dangerous kind of man. He wants to be a musketeer. <laughs> Love inspired him. I'm coming back for you. Honor drove him. What you do is most important for France. I will kill him. The story is legend. All for one! But the adventure is just beginning. The Musketeer, rated PG-13. At theaters Friday, September 7th. Finally, some good news about tires. Pep Boys has lowered prices. Get high-quality 55,000-mile Futura tires now as low as four for one thirty-nine. Hey, when it comes to saving money, all you need to know is where to go. Pep Boys. Do you know you are one year old today? First birthday. Goodness. Mm. Happy birthday, Happy sweetheart. Birthday. Oh, that's good. Let's open the present. Okay, you want to go open the present? Let's see what we got here, huh? Oh, what's in that box, Daddy? Oh, oh my God! You got a big screen TV. <laughs> Get zero percent on all digital projection TVs for one year at Sears Electronic Super Sale. Surprising selection at Sears. You can get your school supplies a lot of places, but there's probably only one place you can also win a free college education: Office Max. With a million dollar. Do people really win these things? At Office Max, they do. Just ask Helena Pesich, who won free college tuition for her grandson at our kickoff event in Skokie, Illinois. Hurry into Office Max for your chance to win the million dollar Max to School Sweepstakes, sponsored by Office Max Charitable Foundation. With 15 scholarships yet to be won, why buy school supplies anyplace else? Red Sox and Angels, Pedro Martinez had a 70-pitch, five-inning simulated game on Tuesday. Barring complications, oh. he will start Sunday against Texas. Meanwhile, Doug Mirabelli drills Scott Schoenweiss's pitch. Red Sox win. David Cohn gets the win, more importantly, and they now trail Boston by three games in the wild card All right, race. Joe Strummer of the Clash celebrated his birthday. That's part of our final cut. <laughs> National Sports Report presents Final Cut. as a catcher. This may be it. He collects his number 300 as a catcher for Mike Piazza. Whoa! Hit a mile in the air. Just in time. What a play. That was a big league play. That was into the first row. Off the leg of Penny. Smothered by Alfonso Soriano. What a catch! Back to back to back home runs. He's got the beautiful baby and he makes the grab. 